I is allowed as the private restriction, then that's the limitation. You need to get a title report to show you the chain of title to see what documents might affect the property, public and private. Page 18, the market, number three. How much would you pay for a Godiva chocolate at your Robbie Stadium or a Dolphin Stadium in August? It's really good hot chocolate. Probably nothing. Who wants hot chocolate in August? You pay a lot for a cold beer. What's the market? And then four, infrastructure. If you don't have roads, water, sewer, drainage, public service, fire, police, all that stuff, probably not much value to the land. Okay? I'm going to run through the next pages real quick because a lot of this was what I've already showed you in the PowerPoint. But page 19 talks about local government regulations. You can skip over to page 28. Those are state permits. And you can skip over to page 32. That's federal. And as I said to you the first class, and as we quickly skim today, federal, state, and local governments are not your friend. They're all going to take a pounding on your head and reach into your pocket. Hire a good law firm to help you through the maze of regulatory stuff. Or a good engineer. Different municipalities do it differently. Sometimes the land use lawyers control the process. Sometimes it's a good local engineer. Sometimes it's both. Okay? But if you work for me, cover your ass, hire the best consultants, tell them the following. What do I need to do, and what's everything I need to do to get through the process? Okay? Don't assume anything. Put their malpractice insurance on the line. Have them tell you. <laughs> Chapter 3. I am not going to review Chapter 3, but I'm going to tell you this. Chapter 3 is two pages, 10 points. I honestly think you need to read Chapter 3. I think you've got to work Chapter 3 into everything you do for your midterm, so for your final and your project. It's kind of like a good little roadmap. So if you're not going to read the book, can you please? Read chapter three, please. Can you put the iPhone down for eight minutes and read chapter three? Should I, should I get on my knees and beg? It's real short. Okay, chapter four. This is a review. Page 40. Number one, page 40. Judge made law. That's called a common law. Remember I said stare decisis? This is why you don't need to relitigate Roe v. Wade every time you choose to exercise your right to privacy. A judge has decided for you. But you need to know what the judges have decided. That's what lawyers do. Page 43, number two, the Constitution. First Amendment rights, Fifth Amendment rights. Page 44, I want you to see some very important words in the third paragraph. Page 44, sunshine laws, open meeting laws, freedom of information. You need to know these. <coughs> Page 44, third paragraph, lines two and three. They're italics, they're in quotes. Sunshine law, open meeting, freedom of information. When your lawyer brings you to meet with Commissioner A, and they ask you, how are you doing today? Don't say to Commissioner A, I'm doing great. 
We had a breakfast meeting with Commissioner B, and Commissioner B's on board. Everything's great. I hope you're half as good as Commissioner B was. That's violating this government in the sunshine. Elected officials cannot talk to each other unless it's at a public meeting. You being the conduit of information between what different commissioners have said is a violation of the sunshine law. Don't do that. You can go talk to Commissioner A, and talk to Commissioner B about your project, and C, and D, but don't share the information. And they can't talk to each other about that either. Open meeting laws, everyone's welcome. That's why there's public meetings. You show me speak at a public meeting. And when I'm done speaking, the public gets to speak for three minutes. Freedom of information. I don't trust that Peter had. He went to law school with Jack Seidel, the mayor. I'm sure they're in good boots. Okay, I want every email that Peter Hen ever sent to Jack Seidel. All of them. Sure, we'll give them to you. That Rick Scott up in Tallahassee wants to be U.S. Senator. I know there's dirt on him. I want every email he's ever sent, ever. Sure, public record, we'll give it to you. Therefore, don't put anything in writing. <laughs> Now, the good old days, we would do text. We would just text one another. I'd be sitting in the lobbyist telling the mayor what to say and the city manager what to do until they said, no, that's also communication. And we had to stop doing that. So then we'd go back to the little wink and nods, you know. But the point is, everything you do is public record. That's why you take work your clothes, you meet people in the sauna. So there's no tape recorder. <laughs> and you talk. And it's an ugly, ah, no. My point is, everything that you put in writing, assume it's going to get to suck up. Every email, every text. I don't have Facebook. Do I think I want people knowing my thoughts to use against me? Travel below the radar. But these are the things don't violate, OK? They can only come back to hurt you. Page 45, second full paragraph starts with, don't make it the mistake yourself. About four lines up from the bottom. You see the word ex parte communication? Let's assume you got pulled over for speeding. And there was a little white bag of powder in the car, okay? And now you're out on bail, and now you're going before the judge, not for the speeding ticket alone, but for controlled substance. And you get to the courthouse a little early to get a cup of coffee, because this might be your last cup of coffee in a long time. <laughs> and you see the judge and the prosecutor sitting there having a cup of coffee. Are you gonna feel comfortable knowing that the prosecutor is trying to put you in jail is sitting down having a cup of coffee with the judge and your lawyer's not there? Gee, ex parte communication, same thing with the officials. <coughs> so what happens at the start of the meeting, the elected officials are supposed to make your decision at the public meeting. But we all lobby them all the time. So this is what happens. Before I give my little speech, the mayor will say, does anyone need to make any disclosures? The commissioner says, yes. Peter Hen came to my office with his land use lawyer. And I went to the property on my own to look at it. Next commissioner. Peter Hen came to my office with his land use lawyer, and 42 homeowners sent me emails against the project. And then you disclose that. It's never as good as well, what was said. But the point of it is we're trying to keep it be a fair process. Because you're supposed to make the decision at the public meeting on the record. OK? 46. Up at the top. Notice how I triple highlighted up at the top. Ethic light of the day test. I don't know if I told this class or not this. I tell the story a lot. 
I used to have the corporate American Express, and I used to travel around the United States doing it. And my wife would say, as I'm leaving to go away for a couple of days, have a great time, go make a whole bunch of money, and whatever you do, just make believe your daughter's there right next to you. <laughs> you know, that kind of like limits a lot of what we do. <laughs> and I used to go to this hotel in Puerto Rico in business that used to be an old convent, and they converted to a boutique hotel. And you walk in this convent, which is now a hotel, and there's this picture this man called Jesus there, like 20 feet tall, looking down, you know. My point is, make believe your mother's watching you, or your daughter, or whoever you hold in high esteem. When you write that email, have that conversation, pass that bag of cash under the table. Too many elected officials have gone to jail, and they keep on doing this. Year after year after year after year. Now in Hialeah, it's okay. Because <laughs> unless, you, well, unless you've done federal time, you don't hold, you don't have the right to get reelected. You know? I don't make the rules. It's a badge of honor. You know? You find that funny? I'm just staying there. You know? No. Don't be one of my students, and don't let me read about you. It's not worth it. Go to the edge, look over the edge, don't cross that line, because you know what? This is what I've learned. Once you go over the line the first time, what's going to stop you from doing it the second, the third? Don't cross the line. Ethics matters. And if I offended anyone from Hialeah, <laughs> page 51. Just so you see, page 51, the word taken at the bottom, Fifth Amendment. Government can't take your property. And just so you don't think I make this stuff up, page 52, first full paragraph. Page 52, first full paragraph. Physical invasion regulatory taken. What case is that? No, that's Loretto. That's the cable line. Physical invasion regulatory taken. Page 53 up at the top. Non-physical invasion regulatory taken. That's the Lucas case. Go to the next paragraph on page 53, line 2. The three-part test. That's Penn Central. So basically, pages 52 and page 53 are that Loretto, Lucas, Penn Central, the balancing thing. This is government hopefully not going too far. Okay? Page 55, first full paragraph. Ready? Believe it or not, line three and four, strip clubs are protected by our Constitution. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Grandma's upset by that. Sorry, Grandma. They have rights too. But this is a great example. Not that I want to teach about sleaze, but I think it's a good way to show you what government can do. Government cannot say, we're changing the name of our city to clean city. And in, in clean city, we will not have alcohol, medical, marijuana dispensaries, or adult entertainment, because we're the clean city. First Amendment rights. They have those rights. What you can do is say they can only be in an industrial part of town. They must be a thousand feet from a school, a thousand feet from a church, and a thousand feet from each other. Because that's the police power. It goes back to government can't go too far and say no, but they can regulate. 
Because I think with a straight face, we don't want kids coming out at school and seeing women bouncing around, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> for, Lord or no, men bounce around, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> square feet leaves no viable Well, option. there's been towns like that where they pass these rules and you do the analysis and you realize that 99% of the town can't do it. Then you bring a lawsuit and the judge says you're not being fair. You've got to be less restrictive. So let's review. First thing I told you to circle was the judge-made stuff. The second thing was the constitutional. On page 56, number three, statutory. This is the elected officials, either at the state level, the federal level in Congress, or most likely your local government passing rules. Statutory. Look at the first line, the first really paragraph, that really short one. In the zoning game, the statutes rule. Most zoning power comes at the statute level. Go down two more paragraphs. Line two. See the word police power? We've spoken about that. Government has the right to protect us. And just so your book has it highlighted, where it says police power, go to the end of that little paragraph, the public's health, safety, general welfare. Government's going to say, sorry, you don't get a two-story <coughs> tower next to a single-family house, because we don't think it's compatible, and we don't think it's good for the public health, safety, welfare for your 15-story tower to be next to a single-family home. I don't care what your pro forma says. Government wins. And then number four, just to complete the analysis, page 58, these are the regulations. This is more at the administrative level. Okay, page 59. I want you to take out every color highlighter you have for this one. Page 59, under congratulations, then the next paragraph, paragraph two, it starts with, of course, you have been diligent. Look at lines two and three. If you don't like the law the way it is, change it. You can do it. I do it all the time. That's what land use lawyers do. That's what lobbyists do. Change it. Just like the urban growth boundary line, if you don't like it, move it if you can. There's a way to do something. Okay, page 60. The first full paragraph that starts with the word local regulations. Go down to lines one, two, three, four, five, and six. Let's assume we're going to get a tattoo on our other arm now. Profitable, marketable, and approvable. If you look at what I've been saying all along, you've got to have your market study your pro forma and your land use analysis line up. But look what this person says. He's a land use lawyer and planner. This is what he says. The developer, being you, take care of the first two. The pro forma and the market study will take care of the last. Ready? A really good concept sells itself and smart communities will amend their plans and regulations to fit the project. Okay? Figure out what the market wants, figure out if it makes you money. And this is the thing. I don't know if you've been to the Smithsonian Institution. I was there and I saw the lunar module from 1969 that went up to the moon with the astronauts, we land on the moon. That thing looked so outdated, I wouldn't go down a little hill at snow time like a sled, thinking the thing was just gonna fall apart. And this thing went to the moon. It looked so outdated. 
Most zoning codes are older than you, and they've been a patchwork. And they don't have the vision of where you want to go today. Change the code. Profitable, marketable, approvable. You make it profitable, you make it marketable, venue's lawyers will get it approved. And then just to conclude this, page 60, the last paragraph, never take the law as a given. If it doesn't work for you, no matter what your agenda or objective is, change it. Chapter 5. Line six in the first paragraph on chapter four. Who's ever the smartest land use attorney in Broward County, I guarantee you, he or she has the following, a checklist. Don't try to be smart thinking you can do this from your mind. A checklist. What are the 10, 20, 30, 50 things on your checklist you got to do for your due diligence. <clears throat> Go to the next paragraph. Last three lines at the bottom. Three steps. Ask yourself these three questions. What do you have? What do you want? And then how do you go get it? <coughs> what do I have? I got some outdated zoning that doesn't meet what I really need. Okay, so now what do you want? I want to change the zoning. And how do you get it? You go through the rezoning process. But it always starts with what do you have? Every piece of property you're ever going to deal with, I guarantee you, is going to have the following. A comprehensive plan, master plan, or general plan designation. Different states call them different things. And it's going to have some type of zoning classification. Every piece of property has that. But it may not line up with your pro forma or your market study. But before you can get to what you want, you get to figure out what you have. Too bad we don't have a third arm, because I would say tattoo this on that. You know, but this is pretty basic. It's trying to keep it real basic. Page 67. Last paragraph. The last paragraph, first line, says the following. The new generation is so stupid because they sit on their couch looking at Google Earth and their iPhone, and they're surprised at the amount of information that can be gained by simply walking the property and the neighborhood. Get off your iPhone, go off Google Earth, that's great for the first thing, walk the property. There's no substitution for walking the property. Seeing the neighbors, understanding the compatibility. You can't sit there, even though I'm sitting in my office the other day looking at this building in New Orleans, Google Earth, that's great. I gotta get on a plane and I gotta get there and I gotta have that aha moment, okay? Walk the property. Walk the neighborhood. <coughs> Page 69, first full paragraph. Among the lessons learned here are that buyers cannot be too careful in inspecting the property and its surroundings. And sellers should never make any representation about the property whatsoever. Every deal that I've ever done, the buyer wants me as the seller to give reps and warranties. I'm not giving you any rep or any warranty. You do your own due diligence. This is as is, whereas I'll give you a 15 day free look. And if there's a landfill there, if there's toxic waste, if there's a burial ground of Pocahontas, that's your responsibility. I make no representation. I'm the seller. I want the wire transfers. I don't take cashier's checks. I take wire transfers. That's what I want. Call me when the wire's here. The buyer wants me to represent everything, which I'm not. Therefore, the buyer's got to do due diligence. 
You're not buying a can of soup from the shelf. You're not buying a stock of Google. What's the stock of Google worth? We know what it's worth. If you don't want it today, you can sell it tomorrow. You probably get your money's back. Once you buy dirt, there may not be another buyer for it for a long time. You've got to do good due diligence. You've got to know what you have and where you want to go and what you want to do with it. Page 73. At the bottom, the last line. What is your home run scenario for the property? If everything could line up, what do you want to get from this property? Do you want a 39-story tower that the guy who bought my property from me wanted? He tried for that and he failed. I got him in 27 and he wasn't happy with it. Now he's stuck with a whole bunch of 12 stories. What is your home run scenario? Is it worth trying to get it? Can you get to it? Page 74. The third full paragraph that starts with some of the most successful developers. If he is right in some of the most successful developers, I suggest you listen. Some of the most successful developers who I've worked with have a way of shifting elements of risk back to the property owner. Yeah, I'll give you a boatload of money to buy your property once I get my site plan approved. I've eliminated a lot of risk at that point. I don't want to buy green bananas. I don't know about you, I might be dead tomorrow. I'm not going to buy green bananas because in four days, they've already buried me and now the bananas are ripe. When you're buying land, you don't want to buy dirt just for the sake of having it. If you want to buy the dirt because you want to put a Mercedes-Benz dealership there, you think you got a good deal, and then you find out, gee, I can't build a Mercedes-Benz dealership, I'm going to be very upset if you say to me, well, the good news is, there is no good news. I got dirt that I now own that I can't use for what I want. Therefore, you go to the seller and you say, we'll give you a premium, a 10%, 15% premium, if you wait for your money until after I get my site plan approved. But not after I get my site plan approved, 31 days after I get my site plan approved, because I don't want the litigation risk. At that point, the government has given me my approvals, the neighbors have put up a shut up and they haven't sued me, I'll give you a premium. Because it's not green bananas, it's yellow bananas. How, how, how many days do they have after to sue after you get approval? Assume 30. Sometimes it could be 20. Check it. I always say 31 days. It's, it's not thir more than 30. It's not, yeah, no. Not, not for government approval. So they can't block you after, after 31 days. There's no, there's no way for them to come back? It's much harder at that point because there's a very, we live by rules or procedures and they got to bring something in a timely manner. Okay? Page 78. The last paragraph, line one, two, three, four, five, six. In quotes, technical term, go in hard. If you work for me and it's my capital, when I can't get my deposit back <coughs> because time has gone by and I'm in the deal and I'm going to lose it if I don't close, that's called going hard. Don't put me in a situation where my money's at risk if I can't get yellow bananas. Your job is to make sure you never have your capital and you can't get your deposit back. If I'm the seller, I'll give you a 15-day free look. On day 16, that million-dollar deposit you're never going to see again. We'll apply it to the purchase price, but you're never going to see it again. I want you to see this on page 76. Last paragraph, 76, last paragraph, you see the word zoning regulations in line two? Then count down line one, two, three, four, five. Zoning regulations, they have become a crazy quilt stitched together with hundreds of amendments over the years. The Fort Lauderdale Zoning Code was adopted in 1970. They have yet to do a major overhaul of it. It's been amended 87 times. Different crazy little things. 
it looks like a zebra with a horn out of its mouth. It doesn't know, it doesn't know what it is. Okay? That's why you've got to read the code, because it might trip you up. That's why sometimes you say, look, can we just start over? Let's do a PUD. Let's throw it out. That's why maybe you change it. Chapter 7. How do we get what we want? Paragraph 2. Paragraph 2, lines 2 and 3. Orchestrate in a variety of approaches and to identify older alternatives to get what you want. What you want is like I said when I first started this book. You want an approvable, buildable project. I don't care if we do a variance, special exception, rezoning, PUD, ABC, XYZ. Let you land use lawyer and political gurus make that decision. There's many ways, all roads do lead to Rome. There's many roads to take. For those of you who did not do well in the Boca Raton um, car dealership, page 81, second full paragraph, it starts with first, up the top. First, that's exactly right. You want to read the zone and the regulations from front to back, and for those of you who are sitting in the second row in a sweatshirt with NUS on it, you read it twice. <laughs> and that's why I always print the zoning code on paper. I don't look at it on my screen, and I mark it. Read, read, read the code. Don't get the flavor of the code as a concept. Read it specifically. Shall is not made, and is not, not. Page 82. Paragraph 3 on 82 starts with perhaps. Line 5 in quotes. These are magical words. As of right means that no type of government approval or public hearing are required other than you simply go get a building permit. That's magic. Do I want to go to a public meeting let 82 year old men and women come complain about my project? No. Next paragraph. So for example, for the uh, uh, boat show, the four square building was as of right? Yeah. So you Someone could have gone there and just put the four buildings yeah, Well, they had to get a site plan approved, but the government had to approve it because it met every criteria. There was no variance, no request. I mean, it, it's as plain vanilla as it is. And you didn't even have to, to at, at that point, you didn't even have to talk to the, to the community. If you, you didn't need to talk to them. You had to get a site plan approved. Right. Okay? Even though it was allowed, well, Fort Lauderdale, nothing's allowed as of right because they got this thing called neighborhood compatibility, which is like a catch all. The concept was there was really no discretion left. If you can get something as of right, and you can get a good double today, as opposed to wait for a possible grand slam two years from now, take the double, take the money, go on the next deal. But the next paragraph, line two, you see the word conditional use. Okay? That's when it's not as of right, that's when you have to, and I use the analogy, an apartment building could be as of right, but the same structure as a hotel is a conditional use of special exception. Page 83, first full paragraph starts with what else could you do? Line four, amend the definition of structure to exclude above ground pools. And I didn't go through the analogy example in this book, and if you read it, you know what I'm talking about. Let's assume you want your daughter to have a cool summer, okay? And you can't afford to sit at a camp, and you didn't get an AMI class, therefore you don't have a very good job, so you can't afford a in-ground pool. All you can afford is an above-ground pool. 
That's for poor people. <laughs> but you did know enough by taking my class to read, read, read the code. And you read the code and you realize that the definition of structure includes above ground pool. Oh my God, it's a structure. That means I have to go get a site plan. I gotta have a public hearing. By the time I go through that, it'll be end of August, going to September, summer will be over, and my poor daughter won't be able to have swim in, and now she's gonna be ostracized by all the rich kids who have their in-ground pool. What am I to do? If somehow you can get the definition of structure to be amended to exclude above ground pools, because they can be picked up and moved around in temporary, wow, I can get that done in June, July, August, she's in the pool. Okay. My point is, read the definitions. Maybe change the definitions. It might be easier than doing a rezoning. Page 84, last paragraph at the bottom. The word variance. That's when you say, gee, I can't meet the rules. But if you go to page 85, second to last paragraph, The variance is usually hard because you don't meet the practical difficulty or unnecessary hardship. But just so you see on page 86, first full paragraph, line one, two, three, four, 90 percent of variances are probably illegal. To get a variance, that means you're not going to follow the code as written. Page 86, first full paragraph, line four. 90% of variances are probably illegal. Page 86, first full paragraph, line four, 90% of variances are probably illegal because they don't technically meet the standards. Let's go to page 88, something more important. It's just a 10 lot subdivision. That's all I want to do. See that first little paragraph under that line two in that first little paragraph, a common scenario? Go to the next paragraph, line two. The common scenario, the political climate is changing. What do you mean, Bruce Roberts, the pro-developer, vice mayor <coughs> of Lauderdale, is not our new mayor? What do you mean Dean Trentellis, who's anti-growth, got in? What happened? What, what, what happened to other non-growth people got in? Where are my three votes? You mean I might be out of business for the next three, six, nine years? The reason I say three, six, nine years is there's re-elections every three years, but there's term limits. So the former pro-growth, Jack Seiler, and his company had nine years of helping us developers. That's the seven fat years they talk about in the Bible. Then you have the seven lean years Coming up, maybe, who knows? When maybe other people say, hey, stop. We don't want uncontrolled growth. Political climate changes. You can't get the mustard off the Big Mac when you don't want the mustard. It's there, the politics. You've got to understand it's a very political thing. Start writing a lot of checks. Now, it's illegal for me, as your boss, to reimburse you for a $250 campaign contribution. Most cities require human beings, not corporations, <coughs> to give checks. So you write your own check and I can't reimburse you. But when holiday time comes around, I can give you a bonus. There just can't be a quid pro quo. Page 97. If you had a fourth arm, we would get another tattoo. Page 97 at the bottom, last paragraph, line two. Phase one environmental audit. Never buy vacant property without doing an environmental investigation. For all you know, there could have been even a shopping center. There could have been a dry cleaner there 10 years ago that dumped the dry cleaning chemicals out. You buy it now, you own it strict liability. 
This environmental stuff is pretty serious stuff. Page 100. First full paragraph. Page 100, first full paragraph. Line two and three. Magical words. Developers agreement. Given the politics of the land use approval process, Whenever you cut a deal and document the deal in a legal developer's agreement that gives you a 5, 10, 20 year bulletproof from changes in political winds, get your developer's agreement done. Page 103, line 3 in the first paragraph. It's all about relationships. If they don't trust you, you're toast. You gotta have relationships. And that's why when you go to different cities, if you work for Wawa, you're trying to do those 500 stores with the three billion we just raised, you're not gonna have time to develop new relationships in every city. Hire the top land use lawyer, the top site planner, the top engineer, the political fixer, and let them help it. It's all relationship driven. How do relationships start? 103 at the bottom, first sentence, communication. You can actually talk to people. <laughs> Page 109. For those of you who are not going to church tomorrow, we'll do a little bit of church now. Ready? 109. Honesty is the best policy. Don't lie. Look, if it's your last deal and you're going to go to Asheville, North Carolina, and never be seen again, I guess you can lie and cheat, but don't think you're coming back to that town ever again. Okay? And it's not just, well, I did it lie. Don't mislead. As the lawyer in the room, I can mislead all day long and never technically lie. <laughs> Page 111. Maintain confidentiality. The neighbors on the other side of newspapers are going to want to know what your company's up to. People are going to want to know. You can say, I'd love to tell you, but given our corporate policy, we can't state that yet. Sorry. But when people tell you something, this isn't, let me, have I picked on a woman yet today? No, I haven't. <laughs> women love to gossip. Did you see so and so with so and so yesterday, seeing so and so? Oh my God. If only her husband found out that he was having lunch. No, you've got to keep people's secrets. Okay, you've got to really do this. It's so fragile of a thing. You want to get your three votes. And if a certain neighbor says something to you, or a certain community leader says something to you, learn to keep your mouth shut. Because if you somehow spill the beans or say something, you don't know what political juice they have to turn it around on you. This is not the gossip talk. God gave you two ears, one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much. Don't offer information. I yell at my clients at a closing table. Keep your mouth shut. We're there at the closing table to exchange a deed for a wide transfer. Don't start a discussion. It can only hurt you. Okay, this is your job. Get to three votes. Okay, learn relationships, learn confidentiality, learn to make people feel that you're trustworthy. And when you breach that trust, it's over. Reach out for support, chapter 9. Up at the top, it's, we'll call it the first full, second full paragraph with the word remember. Remember our planning paradigm. You need to know what you have, what you want, and how to get it. 
But look at the last two lines on page 115. Reach out to the community and make an attempt to get their support. You need community support. Okay? Page 116. Three lines up in the bottom. Best team of consultants. If you don't get the best team of consultants, the other side might, and you might not win. But I will tell you this, that's not always the case. I got approved for Hilton, the Broward County Convention Center Hotel about 10 years ago. Marriott was our competition. They actually had a better team of lawyers and consultants. They out-consulted us. But we had a better project, and we won 5-4. But you want to get good consultants. 119. Last paragraph on 119, and this is the same thing on page 44 in this book. You can get involved, these opinion leaders, in your project early. There are certain people in the community that are movers and shakers that feel they have the right to know, and if they don't think they get special kiss in their ring and treatment, having lunch with them, they're going to hurt your project. That's why you get local talent. Who's asked, do I need to kiss early on so they feel part of the game? Yep. And I better go kiss it. Because if I don't give them the respect, they can stop those three votes. Remember one thing. If a snake comes into the room, I'm going to see a 15-foot snake ready to attack me. The young lady over there is going to pick it up and say, oh, this little six-inch inch room, that's cute. I'm still at the door. I think it's 15 feet ready to kill her. <laughs> Go back to 118, the carryover paragraph at the top. Lines 3 and 4 coming up from the bottom of that paragraph. So 118, the carryover paragraph at the top. Three and two lines up from the bottom. Public perception, and perception is everything. If the public feels you're not trustworthy, you're a crook. If the public feels your project's not compatible, it's not compatible. Perception is everything. Why I get paid the big bucks? 120. Turn opposition into supporters. That's what land use attorneys do. I know how to get the three votes. You should highlight that whole first paragraph under that. But look at the next one. Ready? So it's the second to last paragraph on 120. Sometimes opposition is based on misinformation. Okay. You ever play telephone in grade school? Person A tells person B, tells person C, tells, and by the time it gets down to the end? Oh, so you're not going to put a landfill on the property. That was wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. I'm not putting a landfill in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Oh, I didn't know that. I heard you were. Oh, you're not going to have a runaway homeless shelter for you know, runaway people? No. We're going to make a campaign, we're going to make a community contribution of $100,000 to help the community runaway shelter that's already there six miles away so they could do God's work. We're not putting one here. We're just writing a check. Oh, I didn't know that. I support you. Yeah. People hear what they want to hear. Remember that pig farm I could put on your property? Look at 121 at the bottom, three lines up in the bottom. If you don't support me, I won't get my approvals, and then I won't restrict my property so it'll never be a pig farm. So if you don't want me to ever put a pig farm or who I sell to in the future, you need to support me now, get my approvals, and then I will make sure a pig farm never happens there. It's cut a deal. Now, I can, wrote, I can write a million dollar check to my neighbors all day long to buy their votes. I do it all day long. I can't give a dollar to an elected official. 
unless it's a legal campaign contribution for them out. Don't ever bribe an elected official. Bribe your neighbors all day long. Some of them expect you to. Some of them say, well, make my landscaping prettier. Ready? 123. Show me the money. Sometimes it's all about the money. We can shake you down. We can shake you down for the money. Then you go to page 124 at the top, lines two and three. This is entirely legal, ethical, proper, and sometimes good business. If I'm going to an inner city, and most inner cities have three Baptist churches, we don't talk to each other, and I have to write a $100,000 check to each Baptist church, so each of them feel like they have their community involved, and then I have to go over to the Latin Builders Group, and I have to say that they're going to do my concrete work, and I have to then go to the Blind Indians from Alabama Group, whatever other group there is, and I'm writing checks all day long. Whatever you have to do to get the community involved to support you to get your three votes, you do. That's not unethical. Don't ever give a campaign contribution beyond the limits. Don't ever give a bag beyond the limits. And don't do what the mayor of Boca Raton recently did. The biggest developer hired the mayor of Boca Raton's cleaning company to clean his many, many buildings. Sure, I'll give you $500 per cleaning. The market might have been something less than that. Okay? The developers said, hey, I hired a company. I did nothing wrong. <laughs> the fact that the mayor was not claiming that money. But then if you dig it back, they were playing games. Don't play games. You can write checks all day long to the community. You call it community benefits, call it the payoff, whatever you want, that's left. Don't pay off elected officials. My dad got impeached for that reason, same reason. But he had a car dealership in Smyrna, Tennessee, Chevrolet, and there's only one. So all the police cars were Chevrolet, and they had to get repair or change or anything. So they would go to the dealership and, you know, normally change the oil. So after 40 years of him being a the mayor, they came and they said that is, um, you know, internal money. Yeah. yeah. So is it legal to hire the business or to, to that much money? Like what, what was the issue with that? I'm sorry. Well, one for her, she wasn't claiming the money on her taxes. So that's called federal tax right. evasion. Two, I don't think I think it smells. The biggest developer hiring the mayor and her husband to clean your buildings at probably beyond market rates. Quite frankly, I'll tell you right now, I would have taken those contracts, I would have done it for a 25% discount, and I could have still farmed it out to an actual cleaning company, and I would have done okay. <laughs> um, let me ask you a question. So, what happens if you're in a situation where, in a city that you're working, where, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the politician is expecting you to reason. Look, let me say this in the politest way that I can. I have a cute butt, and I'm not going to go to jail. <laughs> Have I made the point? <laughs> I wouldn't do that deal. Because you never know who's wearing a wire. And you, you, you finally got it? No. <laughs> I got it when you first said it. <laughs> you just don't do that. And I don't care about that's how they do things in certain parts of Miami-Dade County. Don't do business that way. I can't teach you that here at the Nova. Southeast University Business School. You're going to get indicted. Your family's going to be embarrassed. And you're toast. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you hear it all the time that 
but then you should report that person to the ethics commissioner. That's what you should do. Don't do business that way. Okay? It's not acceptable. Okay? Just like, just like you know, the thing called the Ten Commandments, they're not multiple choice. There's ten of them. Let's finish up this chapter nine and then we'll call it a day. Page 127, second to last paragraph. Give me two minutes, we'll be done. 127, second to last paragraph, first line. The project itself can be changed to eliminate the impacts on the surrounding property and turn opposition into support. Your architect's going to design a project that may not be compatible enough. Change the project, get the community support, get your three votes so you don't make 100 million, you make 80 million. Move on. 129 at the bottom. The last three lines. You need to get the public to vote for your project, just like a candidate needs enough votes to win. This is all politics. It's all about three votes. I get three votes to win, you get three votes so I don't win. Okay, and then page 130, which we'll stop here. Second to last line, triple underline the word political. This class, I think it's called land use regulations. It should probably be called land use regulations and political aspects of real estate development. Okay, for next week, I'm going to finish this book. Okay, I am going to ask you to read only one case. This is the Coons case. You can do a Google search. Coons, K-O-O-N-T-Z, it's on the syllabus, for St. John's River Management. It will come right up. There's a dozen PDFs on Google come right up. Print it, download it. I want you to at least touch one legal case while we're here. We'll finish this book. It's, a, it's on the syllabus, but it's the only case you need to read. Now, just so you know, if you print the case out, there's like a four-page cliff notes before the real case that was not written by the Supreme Court. This is an editor's overview. You can read that if you want, but it's a consolidation of everything else. Or you can go right to the case itself. It'll say the opinion. But go ahead, find an hour if you can, read the case. You'll have that aha moment of this coming together. And the real takeaway is this, why I want you to read this case. This gives you in the back of your mind, hey, government, you've gone too far. I don't think you have a rational basis or a nexus. I think you've gone beyond proportionality, and I'm not going to give up that land or pay those checks just to develop. Okay? Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully we have some clean, dry air. If anyone wasn't here last week and I gave you the handout, I'll spend two minutes right now going through those real quick with you. Thank you.